So uh, some of you who've been friends of ours for a while uh, know that for about 12 years, in fact, Craig Nelson was a part with us and some others that are on the screen today, we had a, a nonprofit. And we would recognize, my, one of the things we were best known for was our Inspiration Award event. And it was a, just a glorious evening where we recognized uh, oftentimes just ordinary people, but doing extraordinary things to make the world a better place. And along that line, someone nominated Terry uh, to us. And the, the, the bombshell that is Cheryl Kilmer, who is for 40 years as a social worker, um, has been leading the charge on helping families that are dealing with special needs. And the statistic is something like 92% of families that have special needs children end up with a divorce, having a divorce. Because the pressure, the tension, the, just the overwhelm that comes uh, is so traumatic that they simply are, are ill-equipped to, to care for their child, yet alone to be able to then maintain a relationship in the marriage. So there are over 850 families now that Terry um, has, and some of the folks that have been there at the campus with Terry have been there for 30 plus years. And it's, they, they started as children, they're very much in their mid-adult years. So a couple of um, years ago, also I had the great pleasure of working with Danda Sager on co-working on a, the scourge of human trafficking. And Dan has a heart like ours to, to help eradicate that horrible awful thing. And was delighted, though, to see that he had uh, been asked to come and join the Terry team uh, in the development side. And so I've got two great families, the Terry family and the Sager family joining forces. So I asked Dan if you would just tell us a little bit about Terry. So Dan, I've got you on the meter <laughs> because Dan, like all of us, gets pretty excited. Can keep going. So you got five minutes, man. Land the plane and then we'll bring on Kevin Jerry. That sounds good. And we will move quickly. I totally, uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to get a chance to share about Terry, uh, which, and the support of the special needs community, it's here in the Southern California area in San Diego, but really our reach is international as many, many people are finally realizing how much support is necessary for the special needs community. Um, we support kids and adults that are on the neurodiverse spectrum that um, our mission is so much more than providing services. Our goal is really to change the way the world sees and empowers individuals with special needs. Um, I know that about 12% of America, America's families are dealing directly with special needs um, in their family tree. That means that 12% of your clients, that means 12% of your companies, of your churches, of your community groups, have a very difficult challenge ahead of them. It's actually a very beautiful challenge. And we want to team up with those parents to really address those significant needs. Um, one of the biggest challenges is those parents are gonna outlive their children. And so when you, if I'm sure you all know somebody that has a, somebody uh, with autism or has a child on the spectrum, there is a lot of love going out there, but there's also a lot of pressure that goes that. This year, more children will be diagnosed with intellectual and development, developmental disabilities than cancer, diabetes, and AIDS combined. So what we're dealing with is a movement to really um, pull alongside our families, provide the, the services, the education, the enrichment programs, and we do it, what Terry does is we've really taken an approach. How do we address that life path for a family? Uh, we actually have about 900 clients that are touching uh, with it. Terry touches. Um, you can see just the diversity of the ages. We've got a couple schools that are dealing with some of the youngers. We've got young adults that age out of the special needs programs in our schools, and they don't have a support system. Um, as RJ mentioned, we have uh, group homes, and there's been some guys living there for over 40 years together in a supportive environment, 24-7 care, enrichment programs, and uh, the development at that level and the peace of mind of the families that are able to you know, take advantage of that is truly off the charts. Um, real quick, just as far as our pillars of care, we've, we do have 12 group homes. Um, that is probably the number one challenge. Our biggest challenge is labor today. You know the labor crisis. We don't have enough workers 
to fill out the new homes. And we've actually got a, a waiting list of over 50 people saying, we want to be in a Terry group home. And so that's a real challenge. What we can grow immediately is in our education and our vocational areas. Um, one of the biggest needs for special needs families and for those uh, young adults as they grow is where do you, if, you, if you're if you functioning at the higher end of that spectrum, where are the adaptive jobs or vocational skills? And so we're starting to address that area. We've actually got internships programs in pilot right now. We've got urban farms at Terry. We've got six acres of, of urban farms where we supply about 1,200 pounds of food. It goes to the group homes. It goes to employee base. And they actually have a business that they've started supplying restaurants. Um, but we have interns working there. We've got an equestrian center and there's two interns working there. And we've got a culinary center. That's Andrea right there. Um, she just baked over a thousand cookies as supporting the Tim Tebow Foundation's uh, Big Night to Shine last weekend, where across America and in 45 countries, there was special guests were having a prom night. And here's our Terry as special needs got a chance to support a very special evening for um, honorees and everybody was a prince and a princess at that prom. So we are very involved with adults and with the, you know, performing arts, fine arts, equestrian therapy. Um, all of that is a part of what we do here at Terry to provide a broad, broad array of, of needs to families. One of the things that we also do is a special life quality plan because most, if, if you meet a family where they've got a diagnosis, whether it's as a young adult or as a child, it is the most destabilizing thing in a family. It's thinking, oh my gosh, am I alone? Where do I go? I might have special needs in my community. Who do I, where do I even start? And so Terry's gotten very involved with that. The main thing is we want to serve um, beyond um, what, you know, that immediate need because it really is truly a life path. Um, one of the big transformational things, and I'll throw this up there, I'm sitting in building two right there on this campus of life. That's a 20 acre facility. Uh, we've got the equestrian center down at number one. We've got the vocational center uh, where our culinary kitchen is. That's where my office is. And we just broke ground on, on uh, building number three, which is performing arts and fine arts centers. That's actually, this whole campus is designed to be integrated with the local community. We have venues here. We have weddings out down at the equestrian center. All of this is to um, in triple the ability for us to serve, but to be able to do it in a way that actually integrates with the community, which is key with our mission. So that's what we, that's, boy, that's a highlight. That's, that's a small segment of what we do on a daily basis. Getting a chance to reach into families, work with special needs uh, students and adults. And the cool thing is their special gift, what they give back to us as staff, and to our society is there's a beauty and a simplicity that is there. And that is what this is all about. Of course, it takes a lot of money. <laughs> I appreciate the chance to share a little bit about the Terry mission. 100% of those dollars raised go directly into our services. Um, and we actually, 80% um, of, the, of the services are covered by insurances and, um, and by social services. Terry made a decision long ago to raise philanthropic money so that our standards are high and that we can provide the best of care, and give them their best life. So um, that is fast <laughs> and I do appreciate it. Um, certainly, you know folks in your neighborhoods. Here in San Diego, I'd love to, um, let me be a resource to those families to get them uh, direct the information and the services they need. Thank you so much. Um, RJ, I always appreciate you because you know you have a great way to tie um, wealth and success into significance, which is changing the lives of somebody else. So thank you so much. Arjay. Thank you, my friend. Great. Thanks so much. Well, and as, as Kevin gets the uh, slide deck now already up on his side of it, I just want to let you know that we're going to be um, at the end putting up a QR code. So if you if you haven't had a chance to make a donation, and again, it could be $10, it could be 25, it could be 100, it could be 1000. But um, We'll put a QR code up. We'll also be sending out copies of our presentation and the slide deck as well. And so on that slide deck will be the QR code. 
So I'm uh, switching gears now. And for the man, the reason why you're probably here today is to listen to Kevin Jerry. And I had the opportunity, I'm, I'm part of a group called, called a producer group. Uh, and so even though Wealth Legacy Group uh, does a variety of things, wealth management is what we're perhaps best for, known for at this point, and also business succession planning and estate liquidity issues, and, and also how to sell an appreciated asset, either like a business or real estate, and either reduce, defer, or even eliminate the tax on some of those cases. But we also have a very thriving insurance practice, uh, particularly life and disability insurance, and long-term care. We've got a specialist for that one, too. But at that partnership meeting on our insurance practice, I had the opportunity to hear Kevin, Jerry, talk about what most CPAs, no criticism, because we get lots of referrals from CPAs and attorneys, but um, many CPAs have not been really trained in the best ways to take appreciation for their clients. And so they just use the kind of the tried and true methods, if you will, but they're missing out on an opportunity, particularly since IRS actually mandates, as you're gonna hear from Kevin in the second part of this presentation, IRS mandates a certain procedure to be used, which is more beneficial to the client or to the, to the business owner, to the property owner. But yet again, most of their CPAs, unfortunately, don't know that and they don't tell them how to do that. And so I asked Kevin if you would work us in for his, his busy schedule and he very kindly did. So uh, Kevin will be coming out to San Diego. We're still working out what the dates will be uh, probably sometime mid-March. So if you'd like to have a, a meeting personally with Kevin while we're out here, especially for those you, that I've seen that are that own some buildings or who have clients that, that own a lot of real estate, um, we'll set up a time to go ahead and meet. So just shoot me an email, rj at wealthlegacygroup.com. Uh, it's rj at wealthlegacygroup.com. Most of you know how to find me and uh, we'll arrange for a, a time in, in person if you'd like that. So anyway, without further ado, Kevin, Jerry, my friend, take it away. Okay. <clears throat> thank you, RJ. And thanks for the um, thanks for the opportunity. And everybody, thank you for joining us. My, my name is Kevin Jerry. My last name is J-E-R-R-Y. I know I have two first names. Trust me, it's a long, long story, which we can get into if I meet you in San Diego. But what I want to talk about today is an opportunity for building owners and building investors that we find is missed 95% of the time. And I, I know that number sounds very large, but but we've been doing this for about uh, over 12 years now, and, and that's this, the statistic. And so what we're going to talk about is, is, is the very basics, depreciation on a building and um, how most CPAs are depreciating buildings and a very um, well-known alternative to depreciation. But we're also going to talk about, and this is the, the, the bigger part of it, is what happens when a client who owns a building has to put money into it, has to replace a roof, an HVAC, windows. And some of these expenditures can get, can get very large. But what does is, what is the IRS want you to do with those expenditures, whether they're repairs, they're renovations, improvements to, um, it could be a commercial building, it could be a large office building, it could be Apple Computers headquarters, it could be a little residential rental owned by, um, by a, you know, a, a lady and her husband who own re one residential rental. So law applies to everybody. And the law is very much in the taxpayer's favor. But because the law and, and stuff coming from the IRS can get so convoluted, it can, can get so complicated, it gets to the point where, you know, a lot of tax professionals like myself and my partner just throw our hands up and say, we're just going to do it the old way because the old way can keep us out of trouble. And um, yeah, the client's going to overpay their taxes, but you know, at least we're out of trouble. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the opportunity to, um, to really learn about these regulations, which will help you if you're a building owner or investor or your client, if, if you're a CPA or a tax attorney um, on this. So, so what a, um, a met, let's just talk about what's a method of accounting. Um, a CPA will usually use, I don't know, 25, 30, 40, 50 different methods of accounting to um, tax, uh, tax work, the tax returns, the financials for a client. And what we do is we look for one or two ways to substitute an, an IRS approved method into that substitutes one or two of those methods currently being used with an equally compliant method that actually will create a tax deferral or tax deduction. 
and um and 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 that's what a that's what tax method changes are in fact our our um, our website is tax method change experts because we are experts on changing one or two methods that will create a, a deferral or deduction now a lot of you have heard of cost segregation and cost segregation is a uh, change of method of accounting um, but and, and it's it's very well known and it's optional it is totally optional if the client doesn't want to you know change the way they depreciate their building then they don't have to the irs is more than happy to um to have a, a client overpay their taxes when there is a um a, a really good alternative out there for depreciation and we're just going to touch on this because it's very well known but the basis of how we do things will 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 allow you to hopefully better understand what i'm going to talk about um in about in a, a couple of minutes so this is a federal depreciation schedule and this is what we see every day now a federal depreciation schedule is is going to have um, the asset, um, which actually is the is the um, is the building. So right here is the building, and um, you can see that the basis is two point four million, and then so and and the class life is is 39, 39 years, so which is which is right here. So what happens is the, the straight line depreciation takes this number, 2.4 million, divides it by this number, and that's how much depreciation you take every year. Great. So somebody spends $2.4 million on a building, they get 63,000 in depreciation back. Well, that sounds pretty good. Well, it's not. It's 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 not good because this depreciation is 63,000 is not indexed for inflation, which means that 63,000 is the same now. It's going to be the same in 20 years and it's going to be the same be the same in 30 years. And with inflation running rampant, that 63,000, the value of it, the the buying power from that 63,000 goes way down. In fact, I, I can without you know looking at a calculator, I can tell you that 63,000 in 10 years or 15 years is going to be about half. Um, half the buying power. So what the IRS has done and Congress has done is they allowed an owner to depreciate their building over 39 years, which is great, but they don't index for in inflation. So that, that same amount gets whacked and 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 honed and cut every year, the the uh, you know what what that 63,000 will buy. And that's what we're trying to stop, at, at least a little bit. We're trying to stop inflation from whacking away on that that depreciation expense. And so one, one alternative is called a cost segregation study where you actually take all of the components of a building and you break it, you break it in parts and pieces. So all of the, right now, everything on this page from that previous depreciation schedule is depreciated over 39 years, you know, everything. So what we do and what cost segregation will allow is they, I'm sorry, I have a very sensitive mouse. This will, um, this will allow um, all of these parts and pieces here to be depreciated over five years, which is great. So you've got about $100,000 that can now, the math is 100,000 divided by five, because right now that 100,000 is divided by 39. Right here, in the upper right is all the components that um, that are on the outside of the building. And everything here is all the components on the inside of the building. So all your components on the inside of the building can be depreciated over five years generally. Outside, everything can be depreciated over 15 years. So here we have, I don't know, $200,000 that can now be depreciated over 15. Simple math. You take all of this and divide it by five. You take all of this and divide it by 15. And then here is everything that has to stay where it is. There's nothing we can, uh, absolutely no nothing we can do about that. Okay, so so all of th this is a hotel. We we actually, um, w without getting into a lot of details of who, but there's a, a very wealthy billionaire. He's very well known in the United States. He owns a lot of Four Seasons hotels. So this is a picture of a Four Seasons hotel as it's being built. All of this we can't touch. We can't do anything about. All this has to stay in 39-year property. 
But what about this? This is on the inside of the building. All of the, the molding, all of the flooring, all of the accent lighting. Um, I know I'm moving my arrow real fast. The bar can be depreciated over five years. So we did all of these guys four seasons, um, hotels. I think we saved them somewhere in the na neighborhood of $23, $24 million just by modifying the way he, he depreciates his property. And again, this is totally optional. If you or your client doesn't want to do it, don't do it. Now, the only reason not to do it is maybe you don't have enough income for the year and that depreciation is going to create a massive net operating loss, or you're going to sell your building later this year and you know whatever depreciation you take is going to, you know, it's, it's going to have to be paid back. It, it doesn't make sense. But generally, if the client has enough income and is holding on to their building for two or at least two or three more years, cost segregation is a is and ends up being a no a no-brainer. And um, the way the tax method change works is what we do, we fill out all the IRS paperwork, we sign the IRS paperwork, but generally this is a, this is a different building. It's a tax cost of $465,000. The depreciation taken so far on this building is 45,000. Okay, great. When you do a tax method change, there's sometimes where you have to stop what you're doing the old way and just start the new way. There's other times where the IRS says because of the complexities and the possibility of, um, of missing expenses or double dipping expenses, they, they want you to go back in time and apply that new method all the way to the date of occupancy on the building or when that, that accounting method was first started. And with depreciation, you have to go back and you have to apply cost segregation from day one so that the old and the new don't mix and, and there's inconsistencies, which is a fabulous opportunity. So if, if we had on this client, if, if they had taken cost segregation from day one, as opposed to straight line, they would have taken 88,000 in depreciation. And so what the IRS allows you to do, it's called code section 481A. And 481A says, just take the new method, which is 88,000 and subtract it from the old method where you're gonna get a negative number. You're gonna get a, a number, a negative number of, of 42,000. That's a good thing. That's called a negative 481A adjustment. And, and we're going to kind of get into that a little bit more. But a negative 481A adjustment is a huge, giant Christmas present. It's a Christmas present from the IRS that now we can we are going to reduce this client's income by forty two thousand dollars. We reduce it by forty two thousand dollars, and um, there. Guess what? You have less taxes to pay. There are no amended returns. You don't have to open up closed tax years. Um, there's no. There's really no risk of audit um, because this is an IRS approved method, and that's what that's how cost segregation works, um, and that's why it's. Uh, but but the, and the process is very important. Now, there were, remember I was saying in the beginning, I said, well, you know, what about repairs and renovations and improvements, you know, on a building? How is that handled? How does the IRS want you to handle those? And so they, in 2014, the IRS came out with very hard regulations, very hard regulations on what to do with expenditures on a building or any asset really, but we're just gonna be talking about buildings on any asset that is currently in service. What do you do? These are mandatory regulations, okay? You, you don't have a choice, you have to follow these. Um, but what's absolutely bizarre is that these mandatory regulations will save you or your clients money. Okay. Usually it's the other way around. You get a letter from the IRS saying there's a regulation that's mandatory. You better hold on to your wallet because it's they're going to be asking for money. In this case, it's the other way around. And I know that flies in the face of reason. I know that's a crazy concept, but it is it is true. And here is the quote from the IRS. And I'm only going to read the green because I, I, I don't want to read this stuff. But, um, but over the years, there was a lot of considerable uncertainty with whether you you know, you have a hundred thousand dollar roof repair, let's say a million dollar roof repair. What do you do with it? Do you have to depreciate that over 39 years? 
a um, million dollars, you get $22,000 back a year in depreciation. Th that's not good. Or can you just expense the whole thing in the current year, reduce your income by um, by 100 grand or a million, whatever the repair is, and take it as an expense? That's good. Okay. And if you read the last paragraph, all taxpayers are required to comply with these regulations. And now you're asking yourself, I'm asking myself, and I'm doing the presentation. Well, if this is so great, Kevin, and it's mandatory, why are why is my CPA not doing it? First of all, is my CPA doing it? And if he's not, well, why? Because what you're saying makes no sense, and I know it makes no sense. Um, but that this is is the case. And there's a lot of reasons why they're not doing it. One is they don't teach depreciation in undergrad accounting. They really don't teach it in grad accounting. I have a, my master's degree in taxation. I think I had, I have, out of 15 miserable hard courses, I think depreciation came up once. So in, in fact, I'll, I'll take a quick story and um, I, I promise I will stay on schedule. I promise. So my, my partner um, writes the book on depreciation for the large, world's largest publisher, CCH. He did a class, I think about a month or so ago in Florida, and he, he had four or 500 attendees, all, all CPAs from very large firms. And he asked them, who has taken a depreciation class in the last 10 years? Nobody. Who's taken one in the last 20 years? Nobody. So depreciation is one of those things that's, okay, you know, I, my, my tax software is going to do it and I don't have to learn it. I don't have to keep updated on it. And I don't have to understand regulations that were in, in 14 because I'm just going to depreciate everything. And that's kind of what happened is, is these, these regulations got so complicated. They got so convoluted. There were no bright lines saying, if this, do that. If that, do this. So what the, the um, uh, CPAs just kind of threw up their hands and said, you know what? I'm just going to depreciate everything. That way, I'm not getting into trouble. Yes, my client may be overpaying taxes, but I don't have time to understand these regulations. And what if I get them wrong? What if I get it wrong? My clients get audited. I'm just going to be conservative and depreciate everything. And that's generally why um, CPAs are, are not following these. They don't understand them. They don't want to get them wrong. And there's nobody there to hold their hand and say, you know, uh, expense this this repair, ex depreciate that repair, and somebody who will, you know, sign the documents on the dotted line and take responsibility for it. And that that's that's what we do. And as as far as I know, we're the only firm in the country doing this stuff. <clears throat> but nonetheless, that's the opportunity. And depreciating everything is not wrong. I mean, it, it, it really isn't, <clears throat> but it's not benefiting the taxpayer and it's not, or it, it's as well as these regulations. And the fact that these are mandatory regulations make it even more um, compelling to at least understand the basics of these. And so you're able to move forward. <clears throat> I don't want to get into all of the tests. There's literally 16 different tests that an expenditure has to be run through. And if it passes them all, it can be expensed. Now, these are very simple tests. I mean, they, they really are. Um, and what we found is between 65 and 70% of past expenditures on a building can be expense, assuming those expenditures have been depreciated. <clears throat> and if you take that expense and you run it through these 16 tests today, you would um, you would expense it. But back then, maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, it, it was correct to depreciate it. <clears throat> we can actually go back in time, just like cost segregation, by using code section 481A and correct those past expenditures that are currently being depreciated over 39 years, and we can pull them into the current year and we can expense them all. And that is not, um, that that is absolutely true. That is not an exaggeration at all. So even though, um, let's say you're a building owner, your CPA has depreciated your past repairs. And, and, and um, I don't care if they're 
$100 million of repairs. It doesn't matter. The amount of money doesn't matter. The facts and circumstances matter. So what we're, we do is we, we look at every expenditure and say, okay, if this was done today and we followed these tests, would it be correctly correct to continue depreciating or would we expense it? And if we can expense it, we can go back in time and pull it into the current year and utilize code section 481A to fix, fix is the wrong word, but fix these um, these op opportunities. Yeah, um, real quick, yeah. this is RJ. So um, one of the questions that just came in is, does this increase the risk of audit because it sounds to some it sounds a little bit more aggressive and by virtue of the fact all of a sudden there's a huge deduction does that does that increase the risk of audit so if you yeah, and that is that. that that is a great question the answer is 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 unequivocally no because these are mandatory regulations and um, when you follow mandatory regulations, there is zero risk of an, of, an, of an audit. We've been doing this since 2013. We have never had an IRS agent question even one line item because when we, when we describe, let's say <clears throat> the um, Atlanta Hartsfield International Airport replaced a $10 million HVAC system, 10 million. There's very few CPAs who are going to expense that 10 million, but we can go back into the regulations and actually find examples that follow that um, follow the facts and circumstances of that HVAC replacement, cite them and copy and paste them into uh, the document that says this is why we are expensing this. Because we we based on this example in this code section, this is the IRS regulation says to expense it. So we are going to expense it. And the dollars, and this is what I really want to make sure you guys understand, the amount of the expenditure means nothing. I don't care if it's a dollar. I don't care if it's a billion dollars. The amount of the expenditure means nothing as long as it follows the IRS regulations in those facts and circumstances, RJ. It absolutely, it must be expensed. It, 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 it not only can, it must be expensed. Um, the IRS has a code section called 1016-3. And it's the, um, no, you must take what's allowed or allowable. Some people call it to use it or lose it. An example of that is, um, I have a lot of clients in California that are from different cultures. And what they will do is they will say, Kevin, I don't want to take any depreciation on my building because I you know, don't want to pay it back when I sell the building. And there, there's a lot of you know, a lot of different ins and outs around that. But nonetheless, just for an example. So let's say you don't take depreciation because you don't want to pay it back when you sell your building. The IRS will still charge you that. The IRS will still make you pay that depreciation back even though you haven't taken it. And that's part of taking what's allowed or allowable or the use it or lose it rule under text 1016-3. Um, so that's an example. So if, if, if a client is depreciating their expenditure, their roof repair um, over you know, 39 years, when the regulations say, no, this, this, this has to be expensed, the IRS can come in and disallow that future depreciation. Um, will they do it? I don't know. Um, but they're hiring 80,000 80, IRS agents. And I can assure you that they, and the IRS assures us that they will get to everybody. But um, getting back to my slide deck, and I told you I hate slide decks. That's why, but they're they're here, and um, I might as well, you know, try to make this make sense. Apartment buildings, residential rental properties, and hotels are probably the biggest um, low hanging fruit for what we find. Now, fast food, we just did fifty of the largest um, Burger Kings in Colorado. Um, I think that was a $2 million savings. Uh, leasehold improvements. We have a lot of clients in LA who own office property and a client moves out, another or a tenant moves out, tenant moves in. I think we saved them um, almost $7 million. Um, and, but, but all of these are good, but the ones in bold are probably a little bit better. So here's what, here is a pictorial um, kind of review of what we see every day. We see windows that are being replaced on a building 
that are being depreciated that can be expensed. HVAC systems are huge um, for our business, electrical and roofs. Roofs are by far num number one um, because I, I don't know, my, my parents' roof lasted, I, I swear it lasted like 50 years, but roofs apparently today don't last that long. But roofs are number one, the most common repair or improvement or renovation, whatever that we see on a depreciation schedule, we will show, we will see roof. We'll see the building and then we'll see roof. And we may, may even see two roofs because he had to replace two roofs and his, the client's um, CPA is depreciating them um, along with the, um, the two disposed of, of roofs. <clears throat> but roofs are very common. So here is a, an example. This is actually out of the IRS, um, out of the, it's, it's code section 263, small a, came, I just copied and pasted it, but, and we're just going to read the green. Here's a client that removed all the original shingles and replaced them with new shingles. Now notice, it doesn't say, well, the, the expenditure was over uh, $50,000 or $100,000, or a billion dollars, you could literally, and, and I know this is a bad example, but you could replace all the shingles on the busiest airport in the world, and I know it doesn't have shingles, but just bear with me, and you can expense that, but there is there is this, this mindset of CPAs, oh my gosh, if I expense a billion dollars, oh my gosh, the client is going to absolutely get audited. And the IRS may look at it, but then when they see the example that we followed and they see the regulations from 263 small a, it's right. It's it's correct. It's like driving 55 50 miles an hour, 55 miles an hour down the I-5. You know, you're gonna get passed like crazy, but you know, the police aren't gonna pull you, pull you over. So here's um here's another one, and this is probably a little bit better. Here's a this um is a membrane. He, this owner replaces a roof membrane. Let's it's a billion dollars. Let's take the same example. Let's not do Hartsfield International. Let's say I don't know, LaGuardia Airport. And it's just, I, I pick airports because I'm in and out of airports all the time and they're huge. But you could replace the the membrane on, at LaGuardia Airport um, and it could cost $100 million and it can be expensed. And if it was done 10 years ago, this is, this is the, the greatest part of this. If it was done 10 years ago, we can go back and expense it. We can take the the uh, portion that has not been depreciated of that membrane, and we can bring it into the current year, file all kinds of the IRS paperwork, sign our life away, and guarantee the client will be able to expense that membrane. And 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 the the membrane, this this fact, this the IRS. I'm gonna take a step back. The IRS took ten years to come out with these regulations. So every single one of these examples, it took ten years to perfect. So what the IRS says is, yeah, you may not be able to find your exact situation in these 200 examples. Come close. Pick one that, that best represents it. And we use this one kind of all, all the time. Um, this is uh, uh, here's here's an example with that can't be expensed. All right. So, you know, this is not a panacea. We can't expense everything. There's a lot of stuff that we just can't expense and it has to stay where it is. So here is uh, another, I'm sorry, stupid mouse. Here is um, um, a, a client who ended up replacing, I mean, everything. He took the he took the membrane off. He took the shingles off. He took the little metal things that keep the water from coming in. He took um, he took the the trusses all out. And um, he was when he he was standing on the, his top floor. He looked up and he saw sky. Well, if you see sky, you can't expense it. If you don't see sky, you can expense it. But there, I, I don't want to make this seem like we can expense everything because we can't. But there's sixty to seventy percent of it that that we can. So here's um, this is one client. They were in Southern California. They had a lot of office buildings. Here are um, are some of the uh, some of the repairs or renovations that were done on their building. Here's the date. How much they here? This is what they spent. This is how much depreciation was taken in the current year. 
And with this 40A, 481A adjustment by changing, going back and, and repairing or, or change, doing a tax method change and, and changing the way the CPA you know, um, you know, memorializes expenditures, we, we, we saved him, him and her $260,000. And that was um, in tax year 2022. And this is very, very common. It, it really isn't. All right. So remember, we talked about um, it, he's, he's actually a, uh, a really good client of mine. His name is Billy. And um, th this was a this is a roof that could not be expensed. OK, because if you look if, if without getting into a lot of engineering nonsense, but if you um, if, if you look here, you can see that all of the plywood's gone, all of the shingles are gone, all of those little metal things that keep the water coming out are, are gone. And you can pretty much see sky. And Billy sent me these pictures and he said, Kevin, can I expense this? It's like, Billy, no, you, you can't expense it. You can see sky. So we have to depreciate it. And Billy was kind of bummed out. He's like, oh, you know, I really thought I could expense it. Um, but I said, well, wait a minute. The, I have something that's just as good. So in code section 263a which are the called the tangible property regulations it says <clears throat> if you um if, if you replace part of an asset on a building um and let's say it's a, a bathroom or a kitchen let's say and you replace that asset and you can't expense it i mean it, you just you you can't you try but no and you don't want to you know you don't want to fabricate it but you cannot expense it you can expense the value of the original kitchen or bathroom, all right? So even though you can't expense the new one, when you dispose of a portion of an asset, and in this particular case, the asset's the building, when you replace a portion of that building, you can take the amount of, of the value that hasn't been depreciated, and you can expense expense the value the, the original value of that um, of that component and, and if you think about it, let's just go back to a roof because that's what we're looking at here so no we could not expense billy's roof not a chance but when you dispose of an asset a, a portion of an asset uh, it's called a partial asset disposition you can expense the value of the component that's being retired or thrown into the dumpster and because Billy's building was only a, a year a year old, we were able to take the value of the original roof and expense it and then depreciate the new roof coming in. And if you think about it, it makes perfect sense. So if you have a depreciation schedule and it says building and it's depreciated over 39 years. Now, what's what's in that line? What's in that line item that says building? <clears throat> well, a lot, all the electrical, all the plumbing, the roof, the interior, the exterior, everything's in that building. So when, when you replace a portion of it, which is a roof in this case, the old roof, you can't, you, you don't want to continue depreciating the old roof if the old roof is in the dumpster. And the IRS says you don't have to do that. You can expense it. But somebody's got to calculate what, what's the value of the old roof if the original building was $500,000. I don't, I don't know what the value of the old roof is. That's what we do. That's what we have a team of engineers that do this. It's called a partial asset disposition. Um, and it is missed 99% of the time. So a lot of clients are depreciating one roof, two roofs, two HVAC systems, and, and one of them's not even there anymore. It's gone. It's called a ghost asset. It's an asset you're depreciating that, that's gone. We can expense it, but we can only expense it in the year that it was it was retired. So if you have any clients or you're a client that did any repairs and you renovated your building in 2022, you can take this partial asset disposition in 22, but you can't take it in 23 or 24. If you don't take it in the year it was done and retired, it's gone for ever. But my gosh, what an incredible opportunity is to be able to expense an asset that's your note that you're no longer using. All right. Th th this slide is is one last reason. Going back to my uh, original question that I asked myself is why aren't CPAs doing this? Well, in 2014, 
um, the, the IRS said these tangible property regulations are absolutely positively mandatory. And for every client, Mr. CPA, you have to file paperwork that says you are now using these methods uh, and these rules instead of the rule you learned in college. You're going to use these new rules. Um, and you have to fill out all the paperwork. Well, the paperwork's not a single page. The paperwork's 40 pages. So can you imagine a, a CPA with 100 clients that has to do 40 pages of paperwork at tax time just to tell the IRS that they're 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 going to be using these regulations to determine whether an expenditure is capitalized or expense it, it was nuts it was just the you know the IRS just dropped the ball so what they said is okay if you're a small if you're a big client over 10 million Mr. CPA you file these this paperwork and everybody did but if you're under 10 million, you don't have to file the paperwork, but you still have to follow the regulations. So what a lot of CPAs, including the AICPA, who did a terrible job getting this information out, they, the CPA said, thank goodness, I don't have to spend 800 hours learning these things. I'm just gonna continue to depreciate everything. And as long as I depreciate everything, um, I can stay out of trouble. And that is absolutely wrong. First of all, <clears throat> you if, if you continue to use the old method and depreciate everything, your clients are overpaying their taxes. Second of all, the IRS could say they're misstating their income. Thirdly, the actual tax is going to be is going to be so much higher by not taking advantage of these mandatory regulations. And I understand that makes no sense. And, and you can Google this. I wouldn't believe a word I say. Google tangible property regulations, irs.gov. Go right to the source and see what you come up with and see if uh, everything I'm saying holds holds water. All right. So um, to, so it, so what Re recap 2015-20, what it said is it, if you have a small taxpayer, you don't have to file paperwork. Okay, and that's it. It was designed as an administrative convenience for the IRS. It was designed for nonprofits and very small taxpayers. Um, and many tax professionals believe that the IRS is not going to come back and disallow future depreciation. And that may be the case, but they have 39 years to do that. The IRS on, under a, a Churchill case, and you can look that up uh, for 10, code section 1016-3 says, the IRS has 39 years to audit you. If you own a building, 39 years. There's not a three-year statute of limitation with depreciation. It's 39 years. And the IRS has made it clear they will get, get to every single one of us. It's just a matter of when. So... 1520 really confused everything, and CPAs are were, were confused about it. The AICPA didn't truly understand. But as it's crystallizing, it's becoming very clear that the opportunity for these tangible property regulations is enormous for taxpayers. It's mandatory, and the IRS has 39 years to, to force you to, to make it right. And that is a lot of words and I'm going to stop talking and let RJ talk because he's got a much better voice than I do. Oh, well, you're, you're kind to say that. So let's um, let's do this. Oops, we got that's where we want to be. So a uh, couple of the questions that came in. Um, do you have amend returns, Kevin, on this? And then also, can you do older buildings? And I alluded to being able to, to um, actually go back, there's an old roof and be able to recreate that, the, the engineers you have on the team. But um, so there's two questions. Do we have to go back and, and file amended returns? What's, what? So no, you not only do you not have to go back and file an amended return, you, you can't. Um, so what the IRS does with this code section 48, 481A I was telling you about, it's all part of um, a, a bigger piece of paperwork called the form 3115, which is a nightmare form. It's 40 pages, takes 24 hours to fill one out. So what, what 481A says, when you do a change of method of accounting and the tangible property regulations are a change of method of accounting, you're changing from you know an expense policy where 
anything under 10,000 is expensed and anything over 10,000 is depreciated. <clears throat> so when you change that, um, you actually go back and you use, you, um, you utilize the regulations to the date, to the original date of occupancy. And then, so what the IRS says, and I'm paraphrasing because they don't speak like this, just take the reduction in all of those closed tax years, calculate the reduction in income in all of those closed tax years that this new method would have caused and just bring it into the current year and just pull it all into the current year, call it a negative 481 adjustment and we'll call it even. Um, so you can't follow file a, a amended return, but you don't have to anyway. And we do all the calculation, we figure the income, we put it into the 3115 and then we sign it, which means we are responsible for it, not the client, not the CPA. I love the fact that IRS guidelines are mandatory, and yet it actually saves the client money. So as we wrap up and land the plane here, um, how can people get in touch with you? Because my screen is seemingly, every time I try to show my screen, it's kicking me out. So maybe, Kevin, you can sh pull up your screen so people can know how to get in touch with you. There we go. Here's all my all my contact information. Um, you can call me. You can text me. I love getting texts. You can email me. Whatever is is your preferred method of communication, it, it is now my preferred method of communication. So yeah, any any time, any any uh, any method, just reach out. And um, and I will be more than happy to either have a conversation with you, answer your questions, or if you if you are a CPA or a tax attorney, you have a client. If you just send me an email and introduce myself to your client, you know I'll reach out to the client, copy you, and then we'll you know we'll start and start the process, and usually have a Zoom call. Well, usually um, RJ will will ask for a federal depreciation schedule like the one I showed during cost segregation. It'll show all the assets when they were bought, how they're being depreciated, the amount of depreciation taken. And we will look at that. And then we will um, we will create an analysis for both of the things we talked about today for cost segregation and the tangible property regulations, put it into a pretty 14 page engineering analysis, and then hand it back to the client and say, this is what we, we project. The analysis costs nothing. We do it mostly for us because we want to know what we're getting into. Um, but it's great for the client who's doing due, due, due diligence. And then we send it back to the client and then myself, the CPA and the client can have a quick Zoom call and then decide which way to go. Mm -hmm. no. Now, as my wife likes to remind me, darling, I know you love what you do so much. You would do it for free if you could. But just remember this. The best thing we could do for the poor is not be one of them. So we know, we know that you guys don't do this for free. So why don't you, how do you get paid for this? Where, where do the clients you know, write the check to you? How does that work? It's, it's actually pretty simple. <clears throat> On cost segregation, it's just a flat fee. You know, it's, it's usually... Um, you know, less than 10% of the tax actual tax savings goes to goes to us as a flat fee with the tangible property regulations we we uh, because when we get a depreciation schedule and let's say we do see something that says HVAC um, repair uh, or replacement we don't know if that's going to we're going to be able to depreciate that or not or expense that or not so you know we don't want to charge the client up front or a flat fee for that um, and maybe they don't get a benefit from it. So we don't want to do that. So we split it. We take 5% of the tax deduction. The client takes 95%. And then we get we get paid that way. And there's no fee up front on the rate on the repair regulations for cost segregation. We have to charge 50%. But for you know the direct expense model, which was we're talking about now, it's at the end, and we just take 5% of the tax deduction. And that usually works out for both parties. So we've got a couple more webinars that will be coming up. So folks that are on today, watch for it. We're going to be talking about uh, if you have an engineering company or a law firm or a CPA firm or other professional so professional uh, company, uh, we have a very specialized type of disability insurance program that you can't get any other place else. And it has the best definitions of disability you're going to find. We also were finding that a number of clients have older older parents or maybe even grandparents and unfortunately, uh, elder abuse, financial and otherwise, is 
getting worse and worse. And COVID, we can blame COVID for a lot of things, but it does seem that COVID has, has brought some of this to the forefront. That's good. But there are more and more evidences of elder fraud, elder abuse. And so we're going to be doing a webinar on that. How to know if someone may be taking advantage of your parents, grandparents, or for those that we've got a few uh, octogenarians that are clients as well. How do you know to protect yourself against having this happen? And then uh, another one that we're going to be doing shortly is I've had, even this weekend, uh, some wonderful clients of ours that are greatly concerned about their, their girls. And they're all adults, they're all professionals, but how do we make sure that they're protected once they get married? Because uh, they're a little concerned about one of the uh, one of the prospective grooms here. How do we protect the daughters without them having to sign a prenuptial agreement? Because in my experience, and I've been doing this a long time, Prenuptial agreements are the surest way to get a divorce. Everybody I've ever seen that does a prenup, they're always divorced. So how can we protect our kids, our grandkids from assets and inheritances in such a way that it would not be subject to creditors, would not be subject to a divorce, God forbid, if they go through, um, or they're not at risk of an IRS attachment either. So even IRS can't get the assets if it's structured in a proper way. And so we, we're gonna be talking about that. How do we prepare our heirs to handle their inheritances in a responsible fashion, protected against creditors, divorce, and uh, even IRS. Make sure you invite me to that one, uh, RJ. <laughs> <laughs> well, happy to do it. it. It's definitely coming up more and more. So if you go to the next slide, and I want to just thank, uh, uh, we've had a great time with Kevin this morning. We also had Dan DeSager with us earlier. Um, for those of you, if you haven't had a chance to make a contribution, I just would ask you um, to get your phone out, take a picture of that, That'll take you right to the Terry slide or Terry uh, website, and there you can make a donation, and, and any amount uh, will be much appreciated. So that's it from our side. Thanks so much for being with us. I'm R.J. Kelly, Wealth Legacy Group, and our newest company, Appreciated Assets and Tax Solutions. So good for you, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I can see some of those faces in their phones. Good for you. Keep it up. Uh, and with that, God bless. We have for all of our faults in, in, in our country and the struggles that we're going through. I am so proud to be an American. I'm grateful to be an American. You know, we love this country. And I hope that you as well, as you're listening to this, find some way to just give thanks for being American. Uh, I, I see some of the names are on this list. I know you're making a difference in your world. So thank you one and all. And again, God bless. Bye for now.